we'll jump into the first one really great one um, what can I do about extremely low iron almost anemia on a vegan diet are there any iron supplements that you take or could recommend and she gave me a lot of backstory and a little bit more about like her diet I think what she's doing is more of a high raw diet she is eating a lot of raw food but she is still having some cooked food so I'm taking that into account when answering this question but also it's gonna be like very raw food focused because that's you know what I teach is the most ideal most optimal definitely in my own experience in my experience with clients and other people I've observed so all right I just wanted to start with by saying that hello Maytel Myler welcome um, I'm really really glad this person had blood work done and she knows she has low iron and she knows where it's at I think that is like so very important in and of itself like she's aware hey Frank what's up are you in Hawaii or back on the mainland good to see you in here um, that's a really responsible thing to do is get blood work done see you know where you're actually at and if you need to supplement and start that process and she was talking about different iron supplements that she's been taking and none of them have been really sufficient and helpful to her no matter like how strong a supplement she gets she's just doing the isolated iron supplement and you know my response to that Tina's not here yet but she will be here when are you coming back to the island um, so yeah I would recommend whole food sources of iron okay an isolated supplement clearly it's not working so start thinking about what foods can you include in your diet that are high in iron and thankfully there are a lot of those so first off is vegetables right vegetables greens the leafy greens even some fruits some seeds and nuts microgreens are going to be extremely beneficial as well you all know i love microgreens um but yeah just to give you some specifics whole food sources include green beans beets asparagus mushrooms the white button mushrooms acorn squash and the seeds so if you buy a whole acorn squash you can use the seeds inside i do that all the time when i make raw soups you know if i buy a pumpkin i'll use those pumpkin seeds in my soup um, leeks as well leafy greens spinach kale swiss chard turnip greens beet greens stinging nettle is another one i learned about yeah tina's awesome she's coming here we're gonna do a live together stay tuned for that stinging nettle broccoli parsley um microgreens specifically i tried to look at this it was kind of hard to find um online but my sense is these are ones i eat all the time and i often plug my food into chronometer and i'll see my nutrition for the day and my iron y'all like every single day is on point it is above what is needed it's like I just looked for yesterday, it was like over 26 milligrams and I'm not taking any kind of supplement for it. So the ones I included lately with the sunflower microgreens, my iron has been extremely high. So those are a really great source of iron as well as the pea shoots and the pea microgreens which also taste phenomenal. I'm gonna have some of those in my smoothie this afternoon. Radish sprouts and microgreens also happen to grow really, really well um wheatgrass as well as the broccoli sprouts and microgreens now wheatgrass that's a little like hard to grow you gotta have a lot of space and a lot of trees because then you gotta juice it but this is something i just got handy prop right here dr berg's wheatgrass juice powder i'm not an affiliate i just got this i just started incorporating it hey robin you know about this this is really really awesome stuff and yes there is a specific food combination for iron absorption that's a great point so you want to absorb your iron with citrus as well vitamin c something high in vitamin c so if you're having a bunch of spinach in a smoothie put some orange in there as well put some berries in there and another note about the greens that are high in iron are ones that also contain 
oxalates, which you might have heard about and been like, oh my god, I can't, I can eat too many spinach, I'm gonna like die, it's not gonna be okay. Um, it is gonna be okay, but spinach is very high in oxalates, and oxalates will interrupt the absorption of iron. So, you're not gonna get max absorption, so it's really good to use a variety of those greens and rotate your greens. Don't just be relying heavily on just spinach in particular um, to get your iron and, you know, in your, yes, exactly, kidney stones. So, um, not something to be super paranoid about, but if you do have a kidney condition, it's good to like keep that in mind and rotate the greens. That's why I love the microgreens there. You know, you're not having those issues. Maybe if you have a lot of like the Swiss chard microgreens, um, but the oxalates are not so much a problem there. What else? Um, so we talked about that dried apricots, not like a super high source, but a good source. Dried coconut has a little bit, don't overdo it. It's high fat, high calorie. Raspberries, berries, the red berries in particular, watermelon even. I don't know if y'all have seen those watermelon seeds dehydrated in the store. I, I remember seeing those a few years back and those will have, um, so they have iron in them. So eat the watermelon, eat the watermelon seeds. Don't spill them out, like chew them. They're actually really nice. Try it and let me know what, the, what you think about that. Obviously the seedless ones, you're not gonna have that. I buy my sprouting seeds at True Leaf Market. I have a discount code, it's a, ref a friend referral code in my bio. You can get $5 off and that gives me reward points so I can buy more seeds. So please use that True Leaf Market for the sprouting and microgreen seeds. Yeah, blend the watermelon seeds when you make a smoothie, absolutely. Or if you juice watermelon too. I don't super recommend juicing fruit, but if you're doing that you know include them in there too raisins have some and this girl like I said she includes some cooked food so large white beans are another source as well as quinoa if you're doing quinoa um, pumpkin seeds as far as nuts and seeds go those ones are on top um, really really great again if you're using the whole pumpkin to make a soup or something include some of those the fresh seeds in there that's epic and use some lemon in your soup and then you got your citrus your vitamin c combined with that high iron food um yeah but be sure if you're doing the pumpkin seeds for your iron you balance that out with omega-3 so think chia flaxseed like about an equal amount either in another meal throughout the day or alternating that um, day to day because we'll talk more about omega-6 a little later in the bloating question um, we talked about the wheatgrass juice powder very high in, high in iron amazing high in a bunch of other things as well as barley grass juice powder that's another great product um, daily green boost is the one I use I also have a link to that I am an affiliate with them but I used it for years and years before I became an affiliate like a really legit like it and it's been recommended to me by health coaches that I've worked with before who weren't even affiliates it's a really good product and both of those have a bunch of other vitamins and minerals that help you absorb that iron and actually uptake it and utilize it which is what you want, which is where the iron supplements don't, they're not able to do that because it's just the iron. Maybe they shove some vitamin C in there, but you know, just taking a pill of iron and a pill of vitamin C, not the same as you're taking your wheatgrass juice powder, you know, with a little water and all those vitamins and minerals, or you're throwing your barley grass juice powder in your smoothie and it has a little, some berries in it with some vitamin C. So, Whole Food, the book Whole by T. Colin Campbell, I believe it was by him and another guy, um, really explains that, how the reductionistic mindset and approach to medicine and health and healing in the West is, is that, you know, isolated nutrient thing, whereas, you know, if you're eating the whole food, you're getting it with the water, all the enzymes, you're getting all the other vitamins, minerals, fiber, um, it's really the ideal package for your body to use and it'll know what to do. Um, yeah, so we talked about that. 
So just another like run through. The greens, dandelion greens are really good for iron, spinach, kale, beet greens, red leaf lettuce, turnip greens. For veggies, cabbage, peas, pak choy, broccoli, tomato, leeks, nuts and seeds, pumpkin is the best, then sunflower, almonds, and sesame have a little bit. Fruits, mulberries, plums, black currants, blackberries, watermelon, blueberries, raspberries, apricots, peaches, grapes, pears. And one other note, I can also send you an article. So if you, maybe I'll include that in the description of this, but it won't be a clickable link. If you're like, oh my God, I'm iron deficient, DM me, I can send you a helpful article that has a lot of this information that I referenced. Um, another note, if you're really low iron, check on your B12. Um, how you do that is typically looking at serum B12. You can also look at homocysteine, which is an inflammatory marker that's often high when your B12 is low. And urinary MMA, which is methylmalonic acid, is actually like the most accurate B12 test you can get, but it's often more expensive. So if you don't, you know, if that's not in your budget, the serum um, B12 and the homocysteine are a good pair to get into. And just for iron in general, focus on your green juices. You know, green juices, low glycemic green juices. I don't mean green apple juice, different thing. Focus on your green smoothies, fruit smoothies with lots of greens in them. Focus on your green soups, you know, raw, raw soups with greens or greens on top of them and your big juicy green salads. And that iron can come up on a vegan diet. I've never had problems with iron on a vegan diet, so. You can heal. <laughs> Next question. Hey to everyone who's been coming in. We're we're rolling. We're we're good. Um, microgreen question. It's uh, how do I incorporate microgreens into something I can bring to work? She doesn't really have much of a kitchen at work, and this was the same person. Um, so how how do you do that? It's pretty easy. You know, you can throw it in a green juice right? You can juice microgreens. I actually haven't done it, but people do it. And, you know, you juice wheatgrass, of course, you can juice any of them. You can juice your broccoli sprouts with your celery juice, for example. That might be kind of a fun flavor combination. Um, hey, Carly, I'm wearing your necklace. It's on a different string. It's my Labrador right with some tiger's eye there. Um, so yeah, bringing a green juice with the microgreens in it, as well as bringing a green smoothie. I'd say that's like the easiest thing to do is just make a green smoothie with a ton of microgreens in there. I'm shoving in like two pack cups of sunflower microgreens in my smoothies twice a day and feel amazing and it's awesome. And it's a great way to really use your harvest up pretty quickly before it goes bad, which is a question we'll get to later on. Um, and it's high in iron, so you're like win-win right there. The smoothie I've really, really been loving lately, um, and I could probably have it every breakfast and lunch right now, is two cups of frozen blueberries, which are high in iron, really awesome. Hey, Tina. Um, two bananas, two like regular Cavendish. I'm using smaller ones here, but that's what the equivalent would be. Two pack cups of sunflower microgreens, two teaspoons of lacuma if you like it sweet. Now the bananas I'm using aren't as sweet as Cavendish. You might find you don't need this if you're using Cavendish. How much of a weight in greens do you recommend? Per day, um, I'd say a pound and a half to two pounds if you're just eating regular ones, but if you're eating lots of microgreens and sprouts, you can get away with less. I'm not sure what the exact equivalent would be. I need to get a scale actually, that would be helpful. So the lacuma in there, the apple pie spice, one teaspoon of that, it tastes like blueberry jam, it's so good. Um, a half a tablespoon of chia seeds and two cups of water. Blend that up, take that to work, and you will be like cruising. Your brain will be going and you'll feel really good. If you need more calories, I think this is a girl who trains a lot, um, maybe a runner, put more bananas in. That's just, you know, suited to my calorie needs. But if you need more calories, just add three, four bananas um, versus two and you'll be good to go. 
And if you're going to work, store it in a hydro flask, okay? Those are insulated cups. And, you know, if you're using some frozen blueberries, it'll be cold in there and it'll just stay cold and you don't have to deal with refrigerating it or anything. That's what I do when I take my smoothies along with me. I'm, you know, going on a road trip or going to be gone all day or anywhere really I go. I don't use mason jars anymore to transport them. But, and you can get those at Walmart. You can get like a knockoff one that's a little cheaper at Walmart and it still works fine. But if you do just have like a mason jar or something, you could put those in a little a little launch box for yourself, like you're in kindergarten, with an ice pack in there, bring it to work. Or, you know, you can just bring them in a regular bag and if you have a refrigerator at work, you could store them in there. But that's that would be the easiest thing for work, I would think. Um, if, now this is someone who's like, you know, eating some cooked food. I think at lunch she was having a salad with sweet potato. In that case, she could just use, you know, like a container, even a little mason jar, a little pint or some container, stuff the microgreens in there separately from the lunch she's already bringing and, you know, dump those out on top of whatever you're already eating and just eat them. You know, you don't have to be like fancy and making like a wrap with them or something. It can be that simple. Um, you know, you can even just like munch on them like a snack. Nothing wrong with that. Just make sure you're chewing really, really well because um, that is required. That mechanical digestion or blending is required for you to really get all the benefits and all the nutrients. Cass Witty, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in ages. Hey girl, welcome on. We're talking about microgreens. Okay, what else we got? That's pretty much it for that. Um, I think that's an easy enough way to include your microgreens at lunch and work. You know, the smoothie would be my go-to, but you got options if you don't wanna do that. Even if you're like going out to eat, at work for lunch. If you just bring your little microgreens in the container in your purse, you can dump it on your salad when you eat out too. That's that's easy enough. So our next question will be, I love this one too. Um, what causes extremely painful bloating on a raw vegan diet? Is it detox? Is it inflammation? What can I do about it? And this is again, someone who is kind of like aspiring to be raw vegan, but still eating some cooked foods. I got a lot of specific information on her diet because, you know, if you're having bloating, like give me more information. I need to know what you're actually doing, what you're actually eating, you know, on a raw vegan diet. It's like, she's having some sweet potato, like that's not raw food. So with all of that in mind, um, yes, it can be detox, okay? The other day I actually took, I would just gotten this for the first time and I had it in a little shot of, I had it in eight ounces of water actually, I had it in quite a lot of water. Um, and after that, that was the only thing I did different that day, I felt a bit bloated. I felt like a little pain in my belly. And I think that was a detox reaction um, to that food. So it can be detox, bloating can be detox. It can also be stress. And this happens to me. If I'm stressed out about something, I will have all kinds of pain in my belly and it's awful, you know, it's, it's not okay. Um, if I'm stressed out, you know, even in just a mild way, like I'm traveling, for example, I often get bloated. <laughs> it was happening, like I would get on an airplane and just like get bloated automatically, even if, you know, I was eating like really simple meals. And ideally for travel, I'm in a place where my blood sugar is, is really like chill, it's steady, and I'm used to intermittent fasting, so I can fast if I'm gonna be flying, and that's what I'll do for my trip coming up soon, but that's one way to uh, not be so bloated when you travel. But I mean, it happens to me, if I'm just like changing up my routine often, I can have some like stomach, some bloating, feeling like I have some gas in there or something, and it's like, I didn't, I had my same smoothie I always have. So that, that can happen if you're like a really sensitive person with sensitive digestion as it is, that can happen. Okay, so she told me about her diet and I was reading through what she typically does. And basically, 
I saw the main causes being poor food combining, and I think this can relate to a lot of people, as well as inflammation. Now she was mixing some cooked food in with her raw food. Some people can do that no problem. They have a big salad, they have a sweet potato on it, and they're fine, they digest it fine. Some of us have a bit weaker digestion and that just doesn't work. It just, it causes issues. You have different things coming in, digesting at different rates, and that, that causes bloating, that causes issues. Not fun. So that's something to keep in mind. Maybe, you know, shifting to all raw, if, if she's ready for that, is a good place to start. Um, she was also eating dried fruit during the day. Um, you know, having something lighter, then having some dried fruit, then maybe having something lighter again, and then having her dinner, and then having some dried fruit after dinner. No, don't do that. You know, if you're having digestive issues, I would say if you're using dried fruit, soak it, put it in your smoothie, soak it, put it in your dressing, your sauce, your soup, you know, have it blended. That is super helpful. Um, don't be snacking on dried fruit. This is someone I know she was saying she needs to eat smaller portions, but put that in the smoothie is what I'd recommend. Make a denser, small smoothie and have your dried fruit that way and that'll be easier to digest with some liquid in there. Is that dried fruit? That's that's dense. That's that's got the water removed, and we need water to digest. What else? Okay, she was also telling me about fat and how this bloating, this painful bloating, really started for her when at a time when she was eating tahini every night, as well as half to a whole avocado, and really. You know, that is too much fat from where I'm coming from and what I feel like is the healthiest diet, definitely for me and for others I've worked with and seen. Um, I'd say that's two servings of fat, at least. You know, if you're going with a whole avocado, that's two servings of fat. That could be divided up between two nights. You have the whole avocado and tahini, you're looking at maybe like I don't know how much tahini she was having either. That could have easily been three or four servings of fat um, and just way too much. And that'll like slow down the digestive process. Yay, you're getting seeds. That's so exciting. Oh my God, that's my favorite place to shop. Um, <laughs> anyway, so a more appropriate amount of fat would be half an avocado or two tablespoons of tahini. And she's, she's a smaller girl too, so I mean, that's probably sufficient. If you're a larger person or trying to gain weight, that would increase, but um, that that's all you would need, especially if you're having a hard time digesting food and having the bloating. Another thing, if she's pounding in the tahini and avocado every night, guess what? Those are omega-6 fats. Those are inflammatory fats. Um, you know, is it as bad as like, heating your oil or something no it's not but it's still an omega-6 fat overload and that needs to be counteracted with like an equal amount of omega-3 fat where do you get those your flax seeds your chia seeds hemp seeds are also well balanced omega-3 and omega-6 um i recommend this for her but also anyone who's like omega-3 sick what what are you talking about ratio? Look up Dr. Rick Dina on YouTube. On his channel, he has videos really explaining like the chemistry and everything of the omega-3 and 6 and the ratio, what the ideal ratio is. But typically, 1 to 1 is really ideal, omega-3 to omega-6, or even 2 to 1. I was watching a video he did last night with John Kohler, OK Raw. He has a great interview on there as well. So those are great videos to really dive deeper into. I could do a whole live about omega-3 and 6. It's like a really deep topic. But basically, if you're having too much omega-6, it's inflammatory. Um, the only raw vegan fats high in omega-3 are the ones I said, flax, chia, hemp, and walnuts, but walnuts still have omega-6 in them. The rest are omega-6 mostly. And I'd also say, you know, are you including other inflammatory foods? I didn't ask her this, but if you're having a lot of bloating, what else are you including? Um, are you having a lot of salt? 
Are you having corn? Are you having tamari, soy sauce, soy products, coconut aminos even, nutritional yeast? I found for me, these all lead to bloating, water retention, and digestive issues and inflammation issues in my body. We can talk weight loss on a future live. I'll make a note of that. And also DM me if you want to tell me more about your specific situation. Um, you can also, if you're having a lot of bloating, get a food sensitivity test. I did this two years ago. It's a hair test. I got a group on for it. There's probably like more specialty ones, but this one was affordable. And it it can tell you what foods don't agree with you. It can confirm, you know, if you're kind of suspect about certain ones, it can confirm this. And it can also maybe show you ones you had no idea about. Like arugula for me. I'd been eating that and having digestive issues and I didn't make the connection but the test revealed that for me and it's sad because it's really delicious um, what is what called the food food sensitivity test it was a Groupon at the time I don't know you can look into it but it's a hair test and like I said there may be other ones available and I'd also recommend if you're having a lot of bloating and digestive issues Start including more green juices. Start including green smoothies. Start including raw vegan soups. Blend your food, like blend it up. Make it easy for yourself. I had to do this. I am healing a really um, troubled digestive tract. I'm trying to make it as easy for myself as possible. And I noticed when I started just transitioning from chewing breakfast and lunch and dinner to having you know smoothie smoothie and then dinner like bloating went away significantly and then I, my belly got so much flatter and then I went to um, smoothie smoothie raw soup with like some microgreens on top for dinner just a little bit of chew and the bloating is gone and it's like it's remarkable so if you need to kind of go liquid for a while Consider it. Do it. Make it easy for yourself to digest. And if you are chewing food, chew that food super, super well. Breathe, you know, eat in a mindful, conscious environment, and that'll help quite a lot. And try to minimize stress in your life, too. Law of Attraction Manifesting. Hello, it's been a long time. Welcome. So another question about microgreens. How many meals does one microgreen harvest last? How do you store them? Depends on the microgreen, but I'll just give you examples from sunflower and pea, which are two of my favorite. I love them so much. Oh, they're so good. Um, those, I get two harvests with those. Two harvests from one tray of seeds. It is phenomenal. And from one harvest, I'm getting enough for, I'm sorry for that noise, y'all. I don't know what that is. Um, from one harvest, I'm getting enough microgreens for about five smoothies. And that's like 10 cups of microgreens, like packed cups of microgreens, five or six smoothies um, is what I'm averaging right now from the sunflower and the pea. Um, Let's see. Yeah, it depends on the microgreen. She was worried about having too many and not being able to eat them. I haven't found that to be the case at all. And if you have too much, give them to a friend, give them to a family member, you know, or freeze them, okay? You can portion out. I am raw. They aren't cooked soups. They're made in the blender. Yeah, that's what that is. <laughs> not boiling it's just like blended in the blender and it's it's a soup you know you can blend it until it's warm yeah uh but yeah you can freeze them you can portion them out broccoli sprouts and microgreens in particular are there have been studies showing that they're even like more nutritious and bioavailable when you freeze them because when you freeze them you break the cell walls so you could try that you could you know, freeze them all in one big chunk, or you could do like mini bags or find some kind of eco-friendly way to do it uh, where you have it portioned out like in one cup servings or half cup or two cup, 
whatever you want to put in your smoothie. I realize I, I put a lot in and I've kind of worked up to this level of tolerance, but I wouldn't recommend like doing a bunch of radish microgreens in your smoothie. That's gonna, I mean, some people are into that. I don't like how that tastes though. What else? Okay, what I also do when I store them, I store them in green bags. And those green bags allow gases to go out as they, you know, they need to air out a bit. And it doesn't let the gases in. It doesn't let like the oxygen in. And I tuck those away in my fridge. There's also the Debbie Meyer green boxes, which Taney Raw always recommends. I don't have those personally, but they seem to work for a lot of people. You can get those at Walmart or hsn.com, the home shopping network. Um, but those seem to be really good. Another thing, after you harvest either sprouts or microgreens, you wanna make sure they're really, really dry. So a day before I harvest, I don't water them. A day before I harvest my sprouts, I stop rinsing and draining. They're just chilling and draining and I'm not putting any more liquid in, and I just immediately, the day I'm harvesting, I dump them into my green bag, seal them up, stick them in the fridge. Microgreens, same thing. Um, at least 24 hours before, I'm not watering them anymore. I go in to harvest, either with my scissors or my kitchen knife, and I very carefully, I'm transferring them onto a cutting board, and it can be quite time consuming. I've spent an hour harvesting sunflower microgreens before. You gotta like, you know, be present with it. And like, it's it becomes a meditation and like a conscious exchange. It's really, really beautiful. Um, so I very carefully, I'm cutting them and I'm putting them on a cutting board. And if I see a little bit of soil, cause I grow in soil, I will just cut off the root with the soil on it and you know, put it back in the tray or something. And I just, I make sure they're really, really nice and don't have, you know, don't do like a messy harvest. Oh, real quick, you know, and there's like a ton of soil on your cutting board and soil is flying everywhere. It doesn't have to be that way. Now, if you grow hydroponically, uh, you really don't have to worry about the soil issue at all, but you do want to make sure those are dry. I don't grow hydroponically, but I ordered hemp mats and I'm going to start um, growing hydroponically seeds that are more suited to that because it seems to reduce a lot of problems. What else? Um, yeah, make sure they're really, really dry. And yeah, I told you how to, to how to store them. So good, good true leaf market. That's where I get my seeds. They are really, really awesome. Next question. How do you make a good raw soup? Mine always turn out watery and separate. Well, I love raw soups <laughs> so much. They're so good. They're so good in um, the winter time. Yeah, I'm really excited for the hemp. Your mom has got me super stoked on it. <laughs> um, so this person, I was asking them about their blender for a raw soup and she said she had an Omni blender. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's a high speed blender, but if you have a better blender, you're gonna get a better soup. I had a Hamilton Beach blender when I first got to Hawaii and the soups I was making were not smooth, like they weren't that good. I mean, it was still okay. It, it couldn't even get warm, but it was it was okay. You know, I could have added hot water or something. Um, you know, if you have a crappy blender, like it's not going to be as smooth and probably not as enjoyable. Uh, if you have a high speed blender, it's really going to make a difference. If you have a vacuum blender, it's going to take it to the next level. But I realize, you know, you got to work with whatever you got. Um, I, she's saying they're watery, so use only as much water as needed to blend. Unless you're doing like a carrot soup or something like heartier, um, you're going to need a little bit more water than if you're doing like tomatoes and cucumber or celery, like really watery ingredients, you're gonna need less water, especially for tomato-based or cucumber-based soups. Um, ingredients like dates, raisins, dried apricots, dried tomatoes, you can soak all of those before and include those in your soup for more of a thickening. And, and when you soak them, just soak them with enough filtered water to cover them. So it's just like really 
concentrated soaking water. You get all that flavor and you've also softened them. This is really important if you have the crappy blender too, to soak those dried things, but it'll help thicken up your, your soup and add more flavor. Lacuma powder is another thing that will thicken up a soup and add sweetness and flavor. Sea moss, sea moss, that's like my new thing. Sea moss thickens up the soup and adds like a really nice smooth texture. You can get that from Maine Coast Sea Veggies is where I got mine. There are some other brands, but um, I bought theirs and they sell them in flakes and you like rinse and drain. You soak, rinse and drain those flakes and then you can make a gel. And I made the gel with them. Hey Portia, I made the gel and I stuck that in my fridge and that lasts for a long time. So in my soup, I'll add like a teaspoon to a tablespoon of that gel. And it's also extremely nutritious and lots of different benefits from that. Okay, for a creamy soup, you gotta add in some fat. It really, really makes a difference. Like, I, I do soups with and without fat, and the ones with fat are definitely a lot creamier, definitely a lot, you know, more of that, I don't know, like bisque, like rich, hearty taste, versus I'll do like a cucumber soup with no fat in it and have my fat as the avocado on top. That's definitely like a more watery light soup, but I really like that too. Um, you know, how much fat to add depends on like what your specific goals are, but what I do is two tablespoons of a nut or seed butter um, or a quarter cup of soaked nuts or seeds. Soaked, definitely soaked and rinsed and drained. Very important so you absorb everything, all the goodness, and you don't get any of the, the crud from them. Um, like I said, if you're not using fat, it's going to be more watery, and that's okay. Eat it right away. You know, blend it up well. Don't add a whole lot of water if you're doing like a cucumber soup, like I mentioned. Um, if you want to use avocado as your fat, you want to pulse blend it in at the end. Don't do that from the start because it it like forms like a weird mousse texture. You know, you might actually want to try blending it from the start um, one time. See what the texture is like. See, you might be like, this is really good. Like, I like the mousse vibe. Or you might not like it. You might want to just kind of pulse it and have it more of like a chunky vibe. Um, I don't, I'm like weird about it. I don't like avocado blended in dressings or anywhere really. So I will always use avocado as my fat separate, like on top or like with the soup. You know, I'll have like my spoonful of soup and put some avocado on it and eat it. And I really like that. So I really just enjoy the texture of avocado as it is. Um, as far as flavor balancing in your soup, um, you want something to bulk it up, like a veggie, zucchini, carrot, tomato, cucumber, celery, um, pumpkin, squash. You want something salty. That can be your seaweed, your sea moss. Um, that can be, yeah, pretty much that would be it. Celery is a salty component. Tomato is also a saltier component. You want something sweet. You can leave this out or not. Lacuma powder, date, raisin, apricot. Um, you want acidic apple cider vinegar if you eat that. Um, lemon or lime, usually lemon. I'm like super into lemons right now. I don't peel my veggies, no. Mm -mm. I don't peel cucumber or zucchini. Some people do. It's up to you, especially if it's organic. Don't peel it, you know, get those nutrients. And, and if you're blending them, it's like, it's not gonna be hard to digest the skins. So flavor balancing continued. Um, your flavor punch, you know, like uh, the sun-dried tomatoes or a spice, y'all have so many good spices here. Like a Cajun spice or I've got this uh, fajita spice by Frontier. Um, curry, you know, something like, mmm, yummy. And you want your fat, or not, the fat on the side, as well as your liquid. And this can be water, it can be coconut water, it can be, uh, I've even used herbal tea, like a savory herbal tea. My um, mamaki tea, 
uh, some one time I made it I didn't drink it and it was like room temp I just used that and it added a nice earthy flavor you know nettle tea would be really good you could use celery juice in there you could use carrot juice you could use any kind of veggie juice as um, a tomato juice would be really good as your liquid in your soup but again adjust that liquid according to what ingredients you're using and have your soup right away it's not something like you know you leave it sitting and like go do a million things and then come back to it yeah it might be separated in that case so I hope that answers that question um, okay next question a quick one do you eat corn no I don't I did for a long time I loved it I loved it so much I ate it while I was raw too at the beginning of being raw first few years and I ate so much of it I could eat like at least one cob a day in the summer I remember sometimes I was eating like six cobs a day in the summer like really fresh Louisiana sweet corn loved it um, and I was like dumping salt on it it wasn't the most balanced time at my raw vegan journey but anyway um, then you know, I, I did some water fasting, I started eating cooked food again, I brought it back into my diet with like cornbread and, you know, just corn and salsa and just corn, like in different places in my diet. And I kind of suspected it, like my friend was like, oh, I don't, I think I have a corn allergy and that got me thinking about it. And then I, I ended up doing a water fast, a 21 day water fast. And it was the summertime in New York. It was before Woodstock, 2018. And I started refeeding and I entered, I reintroduced corn because I found some local organic non-GMO corn. You know, a few days after my water fast, I was just gonna have a little bit. And it did not digest well. I had gas, I had bloating. I had, I started passing like hard pellet-like stools and that to me was like a direct indication because you know you water fast you eliminate everything you start adding things back in you can see okay watermelon this digests really good okay cucumber this digests really good tomato yeah you know corn no <laughs> you know exactly what um you know doesn't work so that was a big indication. I stopped eating it after that, and then I had that food sensitivity hair test done, and it did show corn as a food sensitivity, along with some others that I was like, yes, like I knew I was sensitive to soy or lactose, like dairy, gluten, um, many other things. So yeah, since that time, I have not eaten corn, you know, I do, I don't, really miss it like when I see a recipe that looks really good and has corn in it kind of miss it so maybe after like a few years of not having it and feeling like I've, I've healed a lot of my digestive situation I might try it again and see if it works later on but for now I don't use it and you know yeah if if you're gonna eat it get organic get non-gmo if it's not clearly labeled as non-GMO or organic, or you're at the farmer's market and you're able to ask the farmer, don't eat it, because it's probably GMO, it probably is not gonna serve your health long-term. And I think maybe that's what happened to me, is that some of the time I was eating GMO corn, and that could have like been causing problems in my gut, beyond just the corn allergy, but also, the corn sensitivity okay last question it's the big one it's the V word and I don't mean vagina <laughs> what are your thoughts on the V word that's going around all over the freaking place everywhere you look on the mainstream media and alternative media not that I'm you know watching the mainstream media at all because I'm not for my mental sanity um, are there any V words that you think are needed or good? Deep breath. Okay, first off, I believe in the right to choose, first and foremost. Like, it is your right to be like, yes, I want a V word, or no, I don't want a V word. Yes, I want my kid to have a V word, or no, I don't want my kid to have V freedom of choice it's it's our health it's our bodies 
we are responsible for our health. We have the right to choose what, how we treat our bodies as well as what we put into our bodies. I think that is very fundamental human right that needs to be celebrated and honored and respected if we are to remain a conscious human species. Um, yeah, I am not down with any policy that limits freedom like the freedom to travel or have a bank account or get paid or go somewhere or enter a facility or any kind of freedom limited um, due to choosing not to have a V. I'm not okay with that at all. Um, like I said, it's our bodies and I think we have a right to choose what goes in. Also related, there is a lot of propaganda. There's a lot of information and misinformation and efforts being made right now to push them, the Vs, and discredit those who are against them or even just doubting them. Um, as well as vast psychological research that's super freaking creepy done on determining the most effective marketing strategies, the most effective ways to influence, convince, and persuade people to get Vs, especially the V that's coming. And I mean, tons of money going into research psychologically, psychological research. I mean, can we not, can we like study the effect of living foods on health and happiness and depression and like actually like study some important things about what we can do to improve psychology but no the psychological research is looking at how can we basically advertise and market to people so that they actually believe that these things are safe and effective like that is scary and disconcerting and makes me very uncomfortable this is why i stopped graduate school after my master's degree part of the reason um also on the other side of the research, there is a lack of properly designed independent studies to show efficacy and safety pretty much across the board. Um, and also going hand in hand with that, there's a refusal to study kids who did not have Vs and compare them to the V kids and look at long-term health outcomes of the kids who didn't have Vs. You know, are they getting all these illnesses? Are they just sick, sick, sick? Are they, you know, deteriorating and dying and, you know, getting cancer and getting early diabetes and becoming autistic and developing all kinds of neurological issues, behavioral issues, various, you know, physical health issues? Or are they just freaking fine? and actually healthier than the kids who got all the these. You know, there's a refusal to even do this research. And it's like, what do you have to hide? What are you afraid of? And yet billions of dollars going into research that is, you know, will make it look like these things are safe or will make it look like these things are effective, also funded by the creators of the things, of the V's. I mean, come on, that is like some really, really biased stuff right there. I have not seen any evidence that makes me want to get any of them. Uh, the lack of long-term longitudinal follow-up safety studies is very worrisome. As well as the fact that V makers, these companies, these huge corporations, this massive mega industry is off the hook and not liable for V injuries. Um, they have no motive to make them safe or really effective. Um, in fact, the National V Injury Compensation Program, y'all can look this up, was created in the 1980s and this pays out the V injury so that the V companies don't have to, you know, be dealing with all the legal fees and the payouts and all of this from people who are coming forward with injuries. And I looked at this today, y'all, that is a really interesting website to go on if you're like, you're unsure about these, you know, you're like, what's really going on? Go look at that website, you know, go dig into it. What is this created? Dig into any of this, do your own research. 
So in 2019, the National V Injury Compensation Program paid out. It was it's a number so big. I was like, I don't know how to like pronounce this. Is this a billion? Like what is this? There were so many commas. It was like yeah, 225 million. That's like 2.2 billion dollars paid out to people who were injured from these. 2020 it was about the same. Since it was created in the 1980s, I'm not sure specifically what year in the 80s, but they've paid out over 4.4 trillion dollars to the injured. And and this is with rejecting a lot of people coming forward with um, you know alleged injuries, rejecting probably over half the people who come forward. But $4.4 trillion, and you think they're really safe if they're paying out $4.4 trillion. You know, that is, that is really, really disconcerting um, to me. So, no, I will not be taking any V whatsoever. Not the flu V, not the, the C word V, um, not any of them. Um, I will continue to work diligently on creating a healthy, strong, vital, thriving immune system in the context of an overall healthy lifestyle. That's what I'm going to be focusing on. And I really just like super encourage y'all to do your own research, dig into this. Good resources and places to go include the Children's Health Defense. That is Robert Kennedy Jr. I am on their email list and they send out weekly or even daily news articles related to all of this, um, as well as other news that's like pertinent to current events that is, you know, more reliable. Uh, So look up that Children's Health Defense. He's on Instagram as well. I'd also recommend take a look at Pamela Popper on YouTube. She is a plant-based doctor who runs the Wellness Health Forum in Ohio. And she's done a lot of different videos about Vs. She's done seminars, online courses specifically about Vs. And this is something I started looking into actually last year because I was volunteering to give Reiki to cancer patients at a hospital and they needed my whole V record to do this, which is ridiculous and really mm, pissed me off a little bit. But anyway, um, for one of those, I didn't have the booster of one of these Vs from when I was like a kid or something because I got the chicken pox. That's what it was. I had, I had the V and then I got the chicken pox after I had the V. Isn't the V supposed to prevent the disease, not cause you to have it? I mean, red flag right there. But I had the chicken pox, so I never got the booster for it. So they wanted me to get that back, that V again. And um, so I was, I was looking into all this research because I was like, okay, like, you know, I really wanted to give Reiki to cancer patients. And, and I was like, well, are these really bad? I dug into these, you know, years ago. And then I started looking again. I watched a lot of Pam Popper's videos. Um, what I ended up doing was using a religious exemption because I didn't want to have that, that V. Um, because they also, they tested me to see if I had antibodies. Because usually if you have immunity to it, you'll have antibodies. I didn't have any antibodies because my system is really, really clear. It, I had done so many water fasts and years of plant-based and raw vegan and like cleansing and detoxing that my body had completely cleared out any kind of memory or residue um, from those illnesses. So they wanted me to get the, the V or um, declare they didn't even mention that I could declare an exemption. I had to like ask and, and be like, they're like, well, you can get it or you can talk to the person who's in charge of the entire hospital, like the CEO or something. And I was like, yeah, give me his contact information. So I wrote an email and they were like, okay, we'll forward you, you know, to this department. And I went in and got checked. I talked to this doctor and I basically was like, and he's like, okay, no, you don't want to get it. And I was like, no. And he was like, okay, here's your exemption. Like, it was not a big deal at all. So 
that's another sketchy thing, like putting pressure on people to do it when really like there are exemptions. Um, that that doesn't sit well with me anyway, either. So Pamela Popper is a great resource. She's got two websites. She's got the wellnessforumhealth.com where you know you can see some of those courses about them if you really are interested. <clears throat> Excuse me. As well as she's got makeamericansfreeagain.com and this one's really powerful. It is um, building up this platform of people who do not want any kind of mandatory V or a V that has all these strings attached where like if you don't get it you can't travel or you can't you know use your your bank account or any kind of freedom restrictions um about that so if you're really passionate about this go look into her and make americans free again.com i joined them there's also a lot of different things circulating if you if you just hit those two children's health defense you'll know about different things because there are like powerful powerful documentary series and and different um, resources to educate people on this because there is a lot of censorship and these things are hard to find online things are being taken down this might not even be taken down I've been very careful uh, very mindful so do your research um, you know it's your right I believe it's your right to choose and you know I respect you either way but I will not be taking any of that I would no, no, I'll focus on creating health and have, have my celery juice. <laughs> That's my plan. With that being said, um, yeah, please DM me your questions. I've got a really special Black Friday deal coming. Um, I've teamed up with Know Me Athlete, which is a blog and a company I found at the very beginning of my vegan journey. And I will be contributing to a whole massive bundle of value that is really, really amazing and will be at a serious discount. So that is just around the corner. It's a bundle that I actually bought in 2012, 2013, I believe 2014 too, because it changes every year because there are different contributors. And I think it's just so cool I get to be a part of it because... You know, there are those people on those blogs and influencers you look up to, and then you're actually like asked to like be a part of what they're sharing. It's really, really awesome. So more details on that coming later on. Um, thank y'all so much for being here. I appreciate you. Let me know your questions. I'd be happy to answer them. I'm just a DM away. Mwah. Have a beautiful day. Much love. Namaste.